five. I don't think the Conservatives will hold a single seat in the red wall. Four. We're kind of engaged in a class war, I think, and one half of that class war is the publicly funded establishment and their fellow travellers. The COVID inquiry has become nothing short of a massively expensive farce. Everything has become a sort of social justice agenda now. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. From me, Liam Halligan. The news agenda is busy, busy, busy co pilot. Red Wall MP Lee Anderson, who began his political life as a Labour campaigner, has quit the Tories and now sits in his Asheville constituency in Nottingham for Nigel Farage's and Richard Tice's Reform Party. A political earthquake or a mild Westminster tremor? Let's see what we think. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has acknowledged the UK needs a new generation of gas-fired power stations. While this has infuriated some environmental lobbyists, others say it's a responsible move and necessary if Britain is to keep the lights on. The COVID inquiry's ongoing, Alison. Not that you'd know it, much of the media seems to have lost all interest in this official investigation into lockdown, which at least some of the public would view as the worst policy mistake in the UK's post-war history. And now a group of eminent scientists is pointing fingers at the inquiry's shortcomings. But before all that, last weekend saw the 96th Academy Awards ceremony, the Hollywood Oscars. It seems co-pilot that many of the awards were won by Oppenheimer, that Christopher Nolan blockbuster, otherwise known as Killian Murphy's Eyes. Oh, he does have nice eyes, doesn't he? Can't have noticed. He's a pretty boy. He's a pretty boy. <laughs> I think this confirms it's the first rule of the Academy Awards is that they always give the best director Oscar to a director for not his best film. Interesting. So I think... Christopher Nolan fans, my son is a huge Christopher Nolan devotee, would say that Interstellar, uh, Memento, actually, which is a fantastic film, or even The Dark Knight Rises were much better Christopher Nolan films than Oppenheimer. I think why they voted for it, Liam, is because Hollywood likes to tell itself it, to tell itself it can still make you know substantial, meaty movies about big topics. I don't think many people thought it was an absolutely brilliant film. Can I just recommend, actually, to Planet Normal listeners, I saw a very charming, also Academy Award nominated, much smaller film than Oppenheimer called The Holdovers. And it's about some kids at a New England boarding school who, for various reasons of parental neglect and so on, aren't able to go home for the Christmas holidays. And they end up uh, staying behind at school with a really grumpy old pederast played by the wonderful Paul Giametti. And in fact, the one person from the holdovers who did win an Oscar was Divine Joy Randolph. Wonderful. Actually, she's a comedian, Liam, but she plays the a sort of grief-stricken cook of the school. And it's an absolutely gorgeous, warm, brilliant performance. So if you have a spare weekend afternoon, do watch The Holdovers. I enjoyed it a lot more than Oppenheimer. What did you think, Copilot? Good recommendation, Copilot. It's not as if you don't know about films. And as <laughs> some people will know, himself at Pearson <laughs> Towers, he knows a bit about films too. Yeah. Probably the world's leading field critic is Mr. Allison. Pearson. He is. I agree with you. I, I mean, I like long films. You know, give me Once Upon a Time in America, the director's cut yeah. any time. But I thought it was too long, Oppenheimer. Too much of it was indoors, blokes talking in offices, a really convoluted plot. Brilliant acting by Killian Murphy. I mean, I heard him recently on Desert Island Discs, and he did a really good Desert Island Discs. But what's amazing about it is that you're so used to hearing him as Thomas Shelby, and you're so used to hearing him as Oppenheimer in that film. And yet when you actually hear how he speaks in his beautifully deep Irish brogue, mm. a, a wonderful cork accent, it just rams home how good at accents he actually is. And I agree with your other bit of analysis as, as well. My favorite Christopher Nolan film is actually 
Dunkirk, which oh, I think yes. is a masterpiece with yeah. not just Mark Rylance, Kenneth Branner, Barry Keown, who's breaking through before he really shot to fame in the Banshees of Inner Sheeran. Yeah. But also, and I thought he did pretty well, I have to say, I was skeptical when I saw he was cast, Harry Styles yeah. of One Direction. <laughs> he's actually a pretty good actor. <laughs> yeah, he's not bad. But if we look back through Oscar history, as you say, I do live with Mr. Oscar history. And, you know, so many of the great films were never picked. I mean, we'd need Anthony here to tell us, but there are absolutely stunning years for cinema where they've managed to pick some completely negligible, you know, north by northwest. They pick some absolute sort of ham-fisted, useless things. So I think the Oscars, I mean, every year now, the viewing figures go down and down, don't they? I, I think it's, they do. the action has very much moved to television. So from Killian Murphy and Anthony Lane, mm-hmm. your beau, who is an extremely influential film critic for the New Yorker, the one that Hollywood probably cares about most. He'll won't like me for saying that, but it's true. To Lee Anderson, <laughs> that other intellectual titan, that other massive <laughs> cultural figure. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely, yes. 30 P. 30 P. Lee. P. Lee, yes. I've got a bit of soft spot for Lee, actually. He, he usually happens on views and values which are dear to the hearts of former conservative voters. And the thing I wrote about this week, it arose, Liam, from something that, yes, Lee Anderson has basically, well, he was suspended, wasn't he? Or had the whip withdrawn by the Tory party after he said some pretty salty things about Sadiq Khan, mayor of London, being, you know, in the pocket of Islamists. Slightly slightly ill-judged, but I thought that fundamentally he was on to something that people really mind about, which is about sort of my aggressive minority groups really silencing the majority. So Lee Anderson has gone over to the Reform Party. And you've got a lot of Tories being very snotty about it. You know, what I think is, why should, you know, basically, I don't think the Conservatives will hold a single seat in the Red Wall, which they won in the 2019 general election under Boris Johnson. And I do find myself wondering, why should Conservatives like Lee Anderson, I mean, he started out as Labour originally, then became Tory deputy chairman indeed, but why should they remain loyal to a party which is basically going to be swept away in a tsunami? And not only are they going to lose every seat in the Red Wall, they're going to lose a considerable number of seats in their own heartlands. And I don't feel that Tory MPs should be loyal to a party which has been so conspicuously unfaithful to its own voters and particularly its own base. But I think the thing that Lee Anderson said, which I wrote about in my column this week, was he said, I want my country back. Now that, Liam, can often be taken as a bit of a racist dog whistle. You know, it's sort of perhaps there's a slight implication that send the foreigners home. I don't mean that. When I wrote about it in my column, I don't mean send the foreigners home. I mean that the country that we love, whose values we admire and champion and so on, is being undermined. It's being eaten from within, a sort of woodworm attack from within by forces which are obsessed with things. And I was watching, I think I said to you, I was watching the Channel 4 News this week. It's a different story, this Frank Hester, the Tory party donor who's made some very, very unpleasant remarks about Diane Abbott, which we could come on to. But I was watching this news and I was thinking, I am sick of hearing the words gender, racism, diversity, inclusion, Islamophobia, reparations, on and on and on. We just seem as a country, just everything is become a sort of social justice agenda now. And our country, Liam, has got vast problems. I mean, we, you know, we, we talk all the time about energy security. This is quite funny, actually. I've ended up in a WhatsApp group for various major generals. <laughs> it's just me. It's me and all these big military blokes. You are their booty. I am. Their, well, I don't know what I am. I'm their, I'm their kind of little <laughs> dolly running around behind them. But, but the point is, is that if you actually talk to people in very serious walks of life, about what's going on, what's going on with our military. They can't recruit anyone. You know, we, a huge part of our country's, you know, our national security and so on, 
all of these issues. And everything now is reduced to picking scabs. Should the Tories hand back this donation from Frank Hester? I don't give a stuff. I mind that children in school are being taught critical race theory, which undermines their affection and attachment for their nation. I mind that we are seeing Stonewall infiltrating every single institution, corporation, absolutely astonishing attack on our way of life and on children's safety and so on. So it seems to me that this minority, a very aggressive, politically motivated minority, which hasn't had any success at the ballot box, because people like Lee Anderson would think what they were talking about was nonsense and outrageous. And yet they have come to exercise a real dominance and command over our national life, which I am absolutely sick of. I share your frustration, Alison. I mean, I heard I read those words from that Tory donor, and of course, they're completely outrageous. You shouldn't say things like that at all, not even in private, in a business context, which, it, which is what it was. But having said that, we have so many issues we need to discuss. We need to talk about energy security. We need to talk about the housing crisis. We need to talk about the massive worklessness that there now is in the UK. Nine million people of working age on benefits. How lockdown has completely transformed aspects of our economy and almost always for the worst. And we should talk about COVID. We should talk about the COVID inquiry because it has been going on for months and months and months now compared to inquiries held respectively, in Sweden, in Italy, which were wrapped up relatively quickly and had you know, relatively bold primary color conclusions about lockdown. Our inquiry just goes on and on and on as lawyers bonanza paid for by taxpayers. And it is good now to see, as reported in the Telegraph, scientists coming to the fore and saying, hang on, this is more political punch and duty rather than a proper investigation at massive public expense into the cardinal question, what do we do when there's another pandemic? Yes, I I think that point you just made, Liam, because I was reading about us being in this basically post-lockdown doom loop with the economy. And those figures you just quoted for worklessness now apparently becoming embedded in the economy and not just that absolutely stonking 9.2 million workless people figure, but the scale of economic inactivity among the under 25s, nearly 3 million are neither employed nor looking for a job. And that is up 248,000 since last year. I mean, by any standards, Liam, this is atrocious. And of course, as you and I have often argued on Planet Normal, much of this flows from the appalling treatment of our young people during COVID when they were at almost no risk from the virus, yet their freedoms were confiscated. I think the social contract between teachers and parents has been broken now because a friend of mine, I wrote about this this week, she had a letter from school saying her little boy had his attendance had only dropped to 95%. And she went absolutely nuts, Liam. And she said, how dare you? You basically kept him out of school for over a year when he developed nervous tics. His education suffered. He hasn't recovered from that. Like lots of little children, if you talk to teachers and head teachers, they'll say the children haven't bounced back. And yes, There has now been this open letter to Baroness Hallett. Who's chairing the inquiry. Chairing the inquiry, Dr. Kevin Bardosh. He's the director of the excellent Collateral Global, a British think tank which was set up specifically to reflect on pandemic policies. And also another convener of this letter is our Planet Normal friend, Sunetra Gupta, professor of one of the world's great epidemiologists. And I struggle to try and put this, how I feel about this into words, Liam. Sunetra Gupta has not been called 
to testify to the COVID-19 inquiry. Uh, uh, You know, I mean, she knows more about coronaviruses than every one of those members of that SAGE committee put together. Professor of Epidemiology at Oxford Oxford University, University, no less, just to remind listeners. In this letter, which you can read, you'll probably be able to read that if you go onto the Telegraph website. I think, Liam, the least having on Planet Normal and with all our marvellous listeners, we live through those extraordinary and terrible times. And I think the least we were owed was a proper, thorough, unbiased public inquiry that would ask the right questions. And we know anyone who has actually watched any of these proceedings, we have seen something which these 55 leading scientists in their letter have described as a fundamentally biased inquiry, which has so far failed to hear evidence from those who suffered the negative effects of the decision to shut down society. And the letter also points out there is a total lack of curiosity as to whether COVID measures were appropriate, what mistakes were made, and what we shouldn't do in the future. And what we are expecting this inquiry to look at is the vast damage it did from everyone, from people like Robert Styler and Josephine, who was unable to spend the last months of his wife's life with her. Absolutely horrifying. So all the human suffering to the bigger picture of how a generation of young people seem to now have had the habit of work and indeed studying broken. I mean, these are these are phenomenal. So I'm hoping that this letter, this open letter to the COVID inquiry, will seriously now put in the spotlight what an inadequate and clownish inquiry this is, and just not even looking at international comparisons, not looking at what happened in Sweden. It's very hard, Liam, to think that this is anything other, the COVID inquiry, than a backside covering exercise for our political and so-called scientific class. It really is a corker of a letter. It's on the collateralglobal.org website as well. The headlines are these. First, the inquiry gives the impression of being fundamentally biased, say this group of academics. Second, the inquiry is taking key assumptions for granted. Third, the inquiry lacks impartiality in the selection and questioning of expert witnesses. Fourth, the format of the inquiry is impeding investigation into key scientific and policy questions. And fifth and finally, The inquiry risks reducing public trust. And if you go down the list of names, it's astonishing. It's not just leading scientists in this country, like Professor Shinetra Gupta, as you said, but it's leading practitioners of health, known to Planet Normal listeners, people like Carol Sikora, one of Britain's leading oncologists. It's people who are expert in nursing. It's people who are expert in economics. Professor Paul Ormerod, a superb British economist at the University of Manchester. Professor Alison Pollock, very much from the left of centre, a professor of health studies at Newcastle University. This is not an ideological letter in any way, shape or form. My old friend, Dr. Edward Skidelsky, who's a, a philosophy professor at the University of Exeter, people from the schools of psychology, sociologists, criminologists, jurisprudence from the University of Oxford, mathematicians from the University of Edinburgh. This cannot be dismissed as some kind of, you know, usual suspects letter for people who were raising their voice during lockdown as Shinetra Gupta was. This is a very august group of interdisciplinary across the political spectrum, academics. And this must have taken a lot of getting together and as a powerful clarion call, I could say what's taken them so long, but it's a powerful clarion call from some of the UK's leading academics into what is now, as I agree with you, Alison, the COVID inquiry has become nothing short of a massively expensive farce. I'm ashamed of it. You know, the UK is good at this kind of stuff, investigating things, analysis, hopefully transparency. This is the opposite of everything that should be good about the UK. And it's in such an important policy area as well. Examining, as we said on Planet Normal, and I think there's something in this, probably the worst policy mistake since the Second World War, the way we locked down, the extent to which we locked down, and our determination 
of the political media class, much of it, to ignore the massive collateral damage. And indeed, that's why the organization that's brought this letter together is called Collateral Global. It's trying very hard to make our political leaders think and our medical establishment think how we respond to the next pandemic. And that is an astonishingly noble cause that's not being served, in my opinion, and the opinion clearly of many of our leading minds in this country by this inquiry. There was a related study this week. I mean, it's unkind to say it made me laugh, but it was a mental state of the year study, which revealed that the UK was the second most miserable place in the world. (laughs) Now, somehow these sneaky bastards in Uzbekistan have beaten us to being (laughs) the most miserable. I mean, if we can't be the most miserable country in the world, how can we be beaten? Standards are slipping. (laughs) Standards are slipping. We've been beaten by the lads in Tashkent. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> What's going on in Tashkent that we're slightly, <laughs> slightly less miserable? But to make a more pertinent point, I think, from this is why is the UK compared to countries in South America and in Africa, we're coming up as extremely unhappy. And my theory, Liam, is that we are constantly being told now, British people, our history is something to be ashamed of. We're just being bombarded with all this sort of gender nonsense. The views that most decent normal people hold, and certainly the citizens of planet normal hold, are just being rubbish. You know, the stuff about women not being women and so on. I'd just like to end with something really positive because we can feel, you know, as I said, the most second most miserable country in the world. We're seeing a fight back, Liam, from the citizens of Planet Normal. This week we have seen puberty blockers being banned and that is down to ordinary campaigners like Amy Gallagher, James Esses, a former mm. guest on Planet Normal. Really normal, concerned citizens are pushing back against things like the gender nonsense. So let's celebrate that this week, that actually we sometimes feel it's impossible to prevail against this aggressive minority that undermines our way of life. But actually what's been shown this week is that puberty blockers now cancelled for young people and a little bit of the darkness has lifted. Our guest on The Rocket this week is in the business of challenging lazy consensus. Martin Durkin is a celebrated TV producer and director who's made many terrific films, including The Great Global Warming Swindle, which challenged the dominant narrative of climate change, Britain's trillion pound horror story about the UK's national debt. In 2016, Durkin's Brexit the movie supported the UK leaving the European Union. And in 2021's The Great American Race Game, he gave a provocative account of the politics of race in America and of the black Americans who are fighting back. A Geordie by birth, Martin Durkin is a libertarian, formerly connected to the now defunct Revolutionary Communist Party. He has been described as the scourge of the Greens and one of the environmentalists' favourite hate figures. In his terrific new film, Climate the Movie, Martin Durkin returns powerfully to what he regards as the scam of global warming. Why did you feel you had to make it? Well, because everyone's talking such a load of bollocks about climate and have been for so long. It's deeply frustrating if you think that it's all nonsense, the uh, climate thing, because, you know, if you're in polite society and you suggest that, A, you're considered a total demon for even suggesting that it's not true, and B, you always get this come back of, oh, but, you know, the consensus, all the scientists say, everyone agrees. And so I wanted to make a film really that looked into the nature of the consensus as well as the science. Can you just tell us a bit about the pressures that you found that people, scientists are under to support what increasingly uh, looks like something that isn't based on the data? The frustrating thing for scientists, I mean, good, honest scientists in this area, is that you're not really allowed even to point to mainstream scientific data or observations. I mean, you're published in mainstream journals carried out by uh, uh, scientists from very respected universities and so on, even cited by the IPCC and all this sort of thing. You're simply not allowed to talk about the stuff that doesn't fit into the climate alarm narrative. 
And the pressure on them to shut up is extreme. And I think it sort of comes from two sources. One is a rather shallow financial one. This involves so much money, the climate industry now, on the academic side and, and, and elsewhere, that you're really deemed to be rocking the boat if you say that you, know, you don't think this is a problem. There are loads of uh, university departments that rely on money that's got you know, uh, the climate tag on it. Uh, there are a lot of individual scientists whose whole careers are built on this and whose funding depends on this. So you're actually threatening the livelihoods of a lot of people if you dare to challenge this. But in a broader way, it's also become you know, very much a political thing. You know, if you're a, an academic, if you're you know, one of the middle-class intelligentsia, broadly speaking, in the media, in the public sector in some way, in the third sector, you know, that general worldview is pro-government. And it's become, being pro-government has become synonymous with buying into the climate crisis. And so if you say, you know, you think it's not true, then, oh my God, you know, you, you must vote Trump or, uh, you know, you must vote Brexit or you, you're labeled, you know, you must like Nigel Farage. You're suddenly in that sort of demon camp. And so there are these pressures and there's more institutional pressures too. I mean, you're not likely to get funding if you go against the climate alarm because so much funding is connected to this. You're likely not to get published. So there's a, a kind of a huge deluge of crap sort of comes on your head if you dare to poke your head above the, the parapet here. I mean, we've got scientists in the film, as you know, who, are, who talk about it you know, in effect being career suicide if you're a university scientist and you come out strongly against this. Alison and I have both seen preview versions of the film, Martin, of course, Listeners won't have seen the film. It's literally just coming out now. Just tell us briefly the nature of the people who appear in the film and what they say that's so very different from what Planet Normal listeners will have heard on their televisions and radios many, many times over, over recent years. Well, we've tried to keep it to very respected and uh, highly qualified scientists talking about the the, the the science because you know that that's the usual comeback or oh, who says this and so for example we've got professor stephen coonan who was a science advisor to president obama and he was both provost and vice president of caltech which is one of the most respected you know, research institutes in the world and he said look i'm just going to use the official data the official observations to show that this just doesn't stack up you know and the, the idea that this is a, that this is settled at all, but B, that is settled in the direction of there being a climate crisis is nonsense. There is no climate crisis. You know, even their data, you know, does not, there has not been an increase in hurricane activity. There's not been an increase in droughts. There's not an increase in wildfires. You know, it's just, all of this is just not true. And you can see just by looking at the data. And listeners can, by the way. I mean, you, I, I'd recommend, there are some great sites. There's one called No Tricks Zone. Tricks as in car tricks. And it was stacks and stacks of science papers on there that disagree with the, the climate crisis, often written by people who don't themselves disagree. But nevertheless, the data disagrees with the climate crisis thing. We've got Professor Will Happer. He was, um, he's been science advisor to uh, three presidents or four, I can't remember. And he was professor of physics. At, now it's Princeton. I can't remember what it was before. But he's you know, one of the great physicists of his generation. We've got John Clauser, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2022, We've got Professor Nir Shaviv, who is a brilliant physicist, young physicist from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who had been at Caltech before then, and they're dying to make you know dean of science over there. I mean, he's a you know enormously bright guy. We've got Professor Henrik Svensmark, who is a great physicist from Denmark, and we've got Roy Spencer, who's one of the biggest names, one of the guys who invented the weather satellite system. You know, works at and with NASA to develop that, which you know results from. Pretty much the uh, uh, the satellite observations are directly at odds with most of the nonsense that's talked about climate. I mean, I could go on, but the list is terribly impressive. And there are all sorts of impressive people we weren't able to get in, uh, but uh, are you know very sound people. You know, they're not flat earthers. That's the thing. If you hear Al Gore, you know, you'll say, "Oh, these guys are just flat earthers." These people are enormously respected scientists. And the, the thing that gets me, if you watch any of these ghastly BBC programs about climate. They don't back anything up. There'll be this bland assertion, oh, yeah, we're changing the climate. Oh, we're changing the earth, all this. Where's the science to back this up? Where is the science to support these contentions? You know, it's not difficult. Viewers can do it. Get on the internet. Read up what Earth's temperature is today compared to the last 500 million years. Look up where CO2 levels are compared to the last 500 million years. You know, don't take my word for it. Don't take the word of, you know, all the wonderful... Uh, academics I have in my film, go read for yourself. 
I absolutely loved uh, Professor Will Happer, Martin, and the way he speaks. He could walk straight out of a John Updike or indeed a John Cheever short story. And he said, there's this mischievous idea that scientific truth is determined by consensus. And, and I suppose that brought me on to thinking about how we pride ourselves on living in a rational age. And yet we seem to be prone as for millennia, really, or certainly through the centuries, to these spasms of madness. And we could point in recent times, of course, to the COVID madness in which something called the science was used to bludgeon everybody into obedience. Having steeped yourself in this, where did this particular madness arise and has it been kept going because it is a kind of a great money spinner? I think it's it's not a sporadic madness. I think it's a systematic madness. And I think there is a, luckily because of COVID, there's much greater cynicism developing about the what experts say. I think there was, and the same is true of Brexit as well, all the experts lined up and said, well, you know, if you vote for Brexit, the next day the economy will collapse. You know, and the experts say that and they, they challenge Gove. Who are you to challenge the experts? Likewise, in COVID, you know, we were, the experts came out with all sorts of codswallop, which you know, turned out not to be true. And so I think that there, there is happily a growing cynicism about what so-called experts say. And the difficulty is that the experts that we're talking about are part of the publicly funded establishment. You know, they, there, is a, there is a class of experts whose interests lie with there being a big government whose livelihoods depend on government spending and on, on whose jobs are you know, defined and justified by government regulation. So they have a specific class interest. They believe in big government because their livelihoods depend on it. And that's how they view the world. And that's you know, what, what they tend to uh, promote. And so, for example, in, even Liam knows with economics, the number of experts who will say, oh, yeah, it's fine printing money. It's great. You know, don't worry about it. It'll, it's it's going to be OK. Or they say, you know, large amounts of debt. That's fine. We can cope with it. It's not a problem. Huge taxation. Nah, that's fine. You know, the government will spend money, your money for you, and it will you know, generate growth. All sorts of nonsense is kind of spouted by so-called experts who are, in fact, really just reflecting their own particular class interests. And so I think that doing this has really solidified in my mind the view that, uh, you know, this is, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, we're kind of engaged in a class war, I think. And one half of that class war is the publicly funded establishment and their fellow travellers. Tell us how you think that debate on climate change is shifting, Martin. The Tory government pushed back the date at which it's illegal, illegal to make cars with internal combustion engines from 2030 to 2035 to where it was the EU average. You're getting a sense now that there's a bit of realism coming into the debate about climate change. Why do you think that's happening? Well, I think they're coming to the limits of what's possible because if, the, if there are blackouts and if uh, you know, the, the economy collapses, then really they, they, you know, they can't, that, that's, a, that's a brick wall for them. So they've got to rein back a little bit to stop that happening. But I can't see very much that there's a, there's a shift in the kind of ideology. I, I think we imagine that we live in a democracy, but every political party buys into the green agenda. If you think that it's all codswallop and, you know, that, that, that the whole renewables malarkey is, is just going to wreck manufacturing and so on and so forth, and, and you don't agree that, you know, there should be low traffic neighborhoods and whatever, who are you going to vote for? The Tories buy into it, Labour buys into it, everyone buys into it. There is a, a sense in which no matter what, and it's a bit the same with economics, you know, if you think that the state, you know, should, you know, taxation should be, you know, 10% flat rate, the state should spend an awful lot less, the state should be a lot less big. Who do you vote for? This is a stitch up. There is no offer on the ballot paper that says, we're just going to scrap the green agenda. So although they're reining back a little bit and saying, oh, we'll delay, we'll, you know, they still say we're going for net zero. This nonsense phrase, I mean, as if we could survive with you know, not, not producing any carbon dioxide. I'm not sure there's a shift in the debate there. I think there's a shift in the debate among ordinary people. I think there's a, a much, much greater degree of cynicism there. But how that's going to manifest itself, I don't know, because you see the emergence of alternative political movements, uh, you know, reform, 
or uh, uh, other things in other countries, you know, support for Trump. You know, an awful lot of people who support Trump don't particularly like Trump, but they really hate the people who hate Trump. And they regard that as an anti-establishment gesture. And I think that that's going to start happening in other countries too. We have had a sort of warning signal this week. Germany is clearly not going to hit its uh, electric vehicles target. So I, in answer to your question, I think that realism is going to give them a bloody nose. In the end, if they can't make money out of some of these things, then it's going to really hit them. But coming back, Martin, to that very interesting point you made about class, I mean, one of the things that comes out from Climate the Movie is what I would describe as a Puritan finger-wagging hair shirt element, particularly from these middle-class protesters. You know, you vulgar people are enjoying yourself a bit much with your cheap foreign holidays and your white vans. Do you think there's an element of snobbery, almost, in fact, misanthropy, which underpins the climate debate? I think there's a really strong element of that. I mean, I've read, because I've done films before on the environmental movement, I've read lots and lots of environmental stuff. And the thing that finally the penny dropped a few years back, that you could be both anti-capitalist and anti-working class. And in fact, that's what we're seeing. Because how come Prince Charles is anti-capitalist? He buys into the green thing. You know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, the IMF, they all buy into this thing. We strangely have an anti-capitalist establishment. Yeah, the establishment loves taxation because it feeds off it. It loves regulation because, you know, that's its, that's its little empire. So oddly enough, this myth that in a capitalist society, the establishment must be capitalist and pro-capitalist, not true. We have an anti-capitalist establishment and also anti-capitalist politics are quite posh. I mean, back in, you know, I, I, I put on a funny accent now, but actually I come from the Northeast, I'm with Geordie. And, I, and where, you know, when I've had a bit of drink, I started to talk with Geordie again. But back in the North, you know, the kind of working class side of my extended family were the ones who voted Brexit, the ones that voted UKIP, or the ones that actually are quite pro-capitalist. It's the posh element who went to university that are quite left-wing. You know, there is green anti-capitalism is terribly snobby. You know, if you read their thing, they say the world is consuming too much, and they loathe mass production and mass consumption. Oh, my God, we're all consuming far. They don't mean they're consuming too much. And the form of consumption they hate or they hate the IKEA, they hate McDonald's, they hate all, you know, Walmart, Walmart. What they don't hate is, you know, the really posh cheese shops in Highbury and uh, uh, posh vintners and the places where they get the Persian rugs from and the place where they get the nice Italian floor tiles and things like that. You know, their consumption is fine. It's the consumption of the, the, the vulgar masses. You know, I think Earth First organized a puking in a shopping mall. How disgusting shopping malls are, you know, ordinary people. There is a huge element of snobbery in green anti-capitalism. Capitalism, the problem with capitalism, they think, is that it has actually enriched the masses, not that it's impoverished them. That's the weird thing. Martin, I can't stress enough to Planet Normal listeners what a serious and well-regarded filmmaker you are. Even with your often heretical views, your films have been broadcast on Channel 4. You've made extremely well-received films on subjects, including the history of Racial Relations in America, a film on Britain's massive national debt. The one critique I've had of your film is that I felt you set up too false a dichotomy here. It's either we go completely net zero 2050 or we go to fossil fuels. I think there's a much more nuanced position here. I want to see us using less fossil fuels. I want to see us use more hydrogen as somebody who is more than willing to have a conversation with you about the net zero industry and how it's deceiving people in many ways and lying in its own pockets. I want to see us going to fuel sources like hydrogen. I want to see us achieving the battery storage technology that allows us to re use renewables. Do you think there's something in that? I think in terms of energy, I don't know about energy. I don't know about batteries. I don't know about hydrogen. I don't know about fossil fuels. I'd rather let the market decide. You know, if, they, if it's cheaper to do one kind of energy generation, that's fine. If it's cheaper to do batteries and better to do batteries, that's fine as well. It's not that I hate electric cars. It's just that I think that the thing that should determine whether we have electric cars is the normal interplay of industry, the energy industry, manufacturing, and ordinary consumers. And I, you know, whenever planners have become involved, it's, they're usually motivated by things 
you know, that aren't necessarily rational, but by other prejudices. The fact is that, you know, industrial society, which they sort of like to have a whack at, you know, we have the cleanest society in the world. You know, if you want the cleanest air, the cleanest rivers, generally the clean, you go to the most capitalist countries. The dirtiest countries are the socialist countries and the pre-industrial countries or the barely industrial countries. That's where the disgusting pollution is. That's where the short lifespans are. So I, I have a great faith in the market and just basic regulation about not doing, you know, polluting rivers and that sort of thing. But otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to let the market decide energy policy. I mean, there shouldn't be energy policy. Really. There should be an energy market. Your film will have powerful forces arrayed against it, Martin. Do you foresee attacks on you? And finally, how do you think this spell, the very powerful spell, now be broken? Yeah, I'm sure I'll be attacked. Um, my, my, my Mrs. Kate begged me not to make the film because there'd be, you know, goodness knows what repercussions. You know, I made one in 2007, the great global warming swindle, and, you know, it was like the, the, the roof fell on our head. And uh, half the people who worked on the film are nervous about having their names attached, even though they've been very happy to work on the film. And, uh, you know, sort of, I've got a few changed names in the credits. And we were worried about whether we could get it into a cinema, whether a cinema would accept it. It was invitation only, the premiere, because we didn't want to advertise it widely because we thought we'd be shut down. The Spectator and The Telegraph are all very nervous about actually coming out fighting against this. Everyone's terribly timorous. But I think that's why it's so important to come out. We should really worry that the climate alarmists have such a monopoly of public discourse on this, that we have such a, an enormously powerful publicly funded establishment that is able to control directly or indirectly what we hear and what we read and what we're taught, what is okay to think and what's not okay to think. That in itself should worry us enormously. It was 17 years ago since I did The Great Global Warming Swindle, and there hasn't been a single big documentary criticizing the climate alarm since then. That's terrifying that there is such a stitch up on this issue. You know, it is really worrying. I'm expecting to get uh, kicked, but in a sense, the fact that I'm getting kicked made it all the more important to make the film, if you know what I mean. And in terms of what's going to be done, I think the only way this is going to be overturned is by people who are in the working class and the commercial middle class saying, you know, we've had enough of low traffic neighborhoods, of being told, you know, where we're going to put our rubbish and all that sort of thing. There's going to be, I can't, there'll have to be a sort of revolution from below because it's certainly not come, going to come from the, you know, defeat middle class intelligentsia who, who are really promoting this. Martin Durkin, thanks so much for joining us on Planet Normal. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Alison, Climate the Movie, The Cold Truth. And Martin tells us it will be released on March the 21st, so not long. And it's free online if Planet Normal listeners, if they want to watch it, if they search for Climate the Movie on their laptops or their computers, they'll be able to find it. And as Martin says, watch it for free. It's a really terrific piece of work, I think. And, it, and it's really chiming now, Liam, isn't it, with what we're seeing this week is not exactly a climb down, but just a sort of moderation of the net zero position, which it turns out, surprise, surprise, is increasingly untenable when faced with reality. So we've actually had Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg just calling in fact for the net zero 2050 target to be abandoned altogether. And that may be something we hear more about in the run-up to the election. But Lee, we had this very interesting announcement from the Energy Secretary, Claire Cattino, this week, didn't we, about building more gas-fired power stations? It is very interesting. So the UK currently relies on gas-fired power stations for about 40% of its electricity and renewables on some days are up at 40% too. Coal, by the way, has gone from about a third of our electricity as recently as the turn of the century to 1% or 2% now. That's a, an astonishing reduction by the UK. The point I'd make is that the more renewables we have before we've actually found out a way to store renewable energy, the more we need gas-fired power stations in order to fill the gaps when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And that happens quite a lot in the UK, particularly in winter when we need more energy. And this is one reason, Martin didn't get into this in his film, but this is one reason why electricity is so expensive in the UK, because we need all these gas-fired power stations on standby, waiting for when renewables can't deliver on a certain day. No. And so the cost of having those gas-fired power stations just standing there, manned, 
maintained, ready to be literally fired up, that is spread across all of our energy complex, which is why electricity in the UK is so much more expensive than the EU average, both for commercial and domestic users. I agree with you. I've made plenty of documentaries myself, and it is always a huge effort to get a really high-fiber, research-heavy documentary made. And Martin's done it in a way. It's explained beautifully. It's very cleverly scripted. My concern with it, or my one quibble with it, isn't the evidence he provides at the top, which is unanswerably interesting and absolutely should be watched by everybody, the caliber of the people he gets on his film, as we said during the interview. Mm. My quibble, as I, as I outlined to him, and we didn't have too long to talk about it, is that he says he seems to present the only alternative to you know the big net zero 2050 green agenda is to go back to using lots more oil and gas and maybe coal. I don't agree with that. In the medium term, I think we can use more renewables and that would be a better way to go. The danger comes from trying to do it so quickly and all the virtue signaling and class war that's associated with it. It is technology that will solve the problem of us polluting the atmosphere in order to heat our homes and drive our cars. I personally think hydrogen is going to be a very, very important fuel in that regard. And I also think nuclear is going to play a very important role in that regard, as indeed Martin and I and you discussed. But yeah, he will get brickbats thrown at him. He should absolutely plow on as he will. He's a very determined bloke and a very smart bloke. And his film deserves a wide audience and people who believe in free speech and proper debate should actually watch the film before they start slagging it off. It's deeply shocking, Liam, because what he's talking about is some of the most eminent physicists in the world. I mean, literally the winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics yeah. 2020, talking about not just a conspiracy of silence, but actual bullying of academics. No academic who's starting out their career or trying to climb up the ladder can possibly address the fact that the data doesn't support that there's a climate crisis. I mean, it's just a completely mad emperor's new clothes. And I think it's just profoundly disturbing that this is throughout the developed world. These are deeply serious things. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We've had a lot of feedback, Liam, to my piece about the invasion of woke into every area of public life, even private life. And a few comments, but this one struck me from someone who describes himself as slippery. After 20 years in senior roles in some of the biggest global companies with consistently excellent performance, I now await a decision on my fate for, quotes, refusing to meaningfully engage with core diversity training and the wider values of the company. What was my crime? refusing to add preferred pronoun he, him to my email block. I know I have balls and a beard, the former having produced my children and the latter having snagged my wife. My staff know I'm a great big hulking man. And so who in the name of God is this for? I'm not bloody doing it, says Slippery. And if a tribunal or early retirement is the result, then so be it. As an exercise in the current battle, I added up all the diversity, inclusiveness, allyship, unconscious bias and days training, which was compulsory over the last five years. And in a team of 20, over four months of work time has been lost. Yes, four months. You're right, Alison. We are in the grip of a zombie mind fungus and only a very strong pesticide will stop it. And Jane adds, the NHS is exactly the same. I retired soon enough to avoid the worst of it, but a nurse friend who's still there told me she was actually threatened with dismissal if she did not attend a loony session. She went, but was told to leave halfway through for laughing out loud and contradicting the woke fool giving the misinformation. This is absolutely everywhere, Liam, a zombie mind fungus. This is from Christopher. Alison and Liam, I've just received an email from Octopus, my electricity supplier, telling me some good news that from the 1st of April, the amount I'm paying for my electricity will be reducing. Woohoo! They also then go on to tell me that the amount of the standing daily charge will be increasing 
from just over 55p a day to 69p per day. Now, I'm not a maths genius, but I worked out that's just over 25%. My understanding is that the standing daily charge is to cover the cost of delivering the electricity to my home. If that's the case, how can they possibly justify it? an increase in their overheads by 25%, an extra £51 per year per household for doing the same job and for no extra value. I'm sure other utility providers will be doing the same. What on earth is going on? Thanks to you both for taking the time to read this and, of course, for all the great work you do. As I felt compelled to abandon the Today programme after decades of listening just a few years ago, that's, of course, BBC Radio 4's flagship news show in the morning, Just as Planet Normal was taking off, would you and Liam ever consider doing some kind of streamed breakfast news in the morning? Kind regards, Christopher. What do you think, Copilot? Could you get out of bed in time? (laughs) (laughs) I could broadcast from bed. We could start at 6am. We could have Didi the cat doing some of the adverts, (laughs) couldn't we? (laughs) This is from Robert, reflecting a very widespread view. Our country is not recognisable anymore, says Robert. Neither is the Conservative Party. I'm a former Conservative Party member and activist. I joined the Young Conservatives in 1982 when I was 17. Back then, the Conservative Party was the Conservative Party. Now it's no better than the Social Democratic Party. I want a proper Conservative Party to vote for. As it currently stands, Conservative Party led by Sunak is not fit for purpose. Failure to tackle immigration, both legal and illegal, failing the pensioners in last week's budget and forgetting who their core voter base is. The red wall is already lost and the grey wall is heading in the same direction. The only party worth voting for is reform. I should just add, Liam, that we've just had the worst ever polling for the Conservatives. And I think that even the sleepiest Tory MP is waking up to the fact that Armageddon is nigh. So it'd be interesting to see in the next couple of weeks if reform manages to close the gap with the Conservative Party. Because if we get to a a point where reform is 15% and the Tory party is 18, then all bets are off, aren't they? So the Tories are currently on three, four, eight seats. They started the parliament with three, six, five by-elections and, and, and so on. What do you think, co-pilot? 150? 120? 100? <laughs> <laughs> you know me, my total's yeah. going down and down. Is it still triple digit? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to go for double digit now. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to go for double digits. I think the end is nigh. I mean, I think they've absolutely brought it on themselves. And I think we're seeing now... People outside the fold have been kicked out of government. Suella Braverman, who I'm actually meeting next week, Robert Jenrick. These people are shouting at them to do something. Miriam Cates, as we know, all these people and Danny Kruger from the New Conservatives desperately trying to get the party back onto the course that, of course, won them a fantastic majority. But I think it's going to be an extraordinary meltdown. And as we've said, Liam, we can't say this often enough. We are looking at a landslide majority for a Labour party that doesn't enjoy huge popular support. This is an extraordinary moment in our history. This is kind of a none of the above moment, but which will deliver a very, very powerful Labour government to do God knows what. And on that bombshell. Double digits. Crikey. That's it from Planet Normal for another week as we no, leave our hang sanctuary. on a minute. You said you're going to eat something, haven't you? You're going to eat a hat or something. I think producers are planning the nature of the hat. The you're campaign going to be hasn't even started yet. <laughs> keep your wig on. <laughs> and I'll keep my hat on. To be eaten later. <laughs> and that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week. It's Alice's turn. Yes, it's going to be Christopher for his extraordinary spotting the terrifying percentage rise in his energy bill. Christopher, please send in your name and address and we will send a a marvellous Planet Normal mug to you. And as we speed away from Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bajard, Cass Ho and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other until next week. It's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. (laughs) 